And welcome, friends, to this, the Wednesday edition of the Grace Hour. Once again, broadcasting live right here from our studios. And our studios are located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach right here in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland. Great to have you with us, friends, on this Wednesday edition of our broadcast. My name is Pastor John Love. Joining me in the studio, as he does each and every Wednesday, Pastor Barry Quirk will be your hosts for today's broadcast on this day before we celebrate Thanksgiving here in our country and hopefully in some other parts of the world. If you're a believer, I know that gratitude is what characterizes your life on a daily basis, but we will set apart tomorrow as a day of great gratitude, celebration, and thanksgiving to God for all that he has done for each one of us. But today's broadcast, uh, well, it's we're continuing the theme all week long of the Grace Hour about work and the Christian life. And today, we'll talk about learning proper balance between work and the family and the ministry. Mm. And Pastor Barry, I know that you were on the mission field for 10 years plus, and of course, now back here as the principal of the Greater Grace Christian Academy in Baltimore and a staff pastor here at the Greater Grace World Outreach. Sometimes uh, there's a lot on our plate. And there's a lot to juggle, and we have to find that balance in our lives, don't we? Yeah, without a doubt. And um, happy Thanksgiving, Pest Love. Good to have you here. We we had our little, uh, just before we jump into the, the main topic here, we had a little get-together last night with the alumni from Greater Grace Christian Academy, and it was great to be there. And, mm. and we had a chance to honor you for your years of service to the school and to the the ministry and to the youth, and it was a, a really blessed time. And also, a happy anniversary, 47th anniversary to Thank you and you. your beloved Maureen. And uh, mm-hmm. we do have a lot to be thankful for, amen. don't we? Yeah, amen to that. And uh, we're thankful for the the life that you have uh, shared with us. And and really, this is right on topic because, you know, our ministries, our, our family life, um, you know, how do we— how do we balance having a ministry life and a family life and not causing one to suffer if we're spending time with the other? And uh, so this is, I think, and, and not only just as pastors, but as people who are given to um, the study of the word, church members, people who are part of the body of Christ, have a big part, actually, in that equilibrium that happens um, with a pastor who maybe a, has a real heart for the ministry, but at the same time, He's not alone. He can't be a, the pastor for the entire ministry and then expect his family life to be something exemplary to the people that he's ministering to and encouraging to have healthy family lives. So it's a great topic, and I think the more that we have spent time doing ministry and having family, we realize we still have a lot to learn about uh, this. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a great topic that we can encourage our listeners and ourselves in today. Yeah. Um, I remember, and, and I don't think that this is too far off track, um, working uh, on a, a full-time basis after graduating from high school for a, a company whose name uh, we don't have to mention. But I'm working for the company, and, and there were some believers uh, that I was with in the local assembly at that time in New England. And they asked, you know, are they, are they hiring? Is there any, are there any job positions available? And I said, yes, yes, there are. And so they would come and they filled out applications and they were, they were hired. But I remember this one brother, he came and he was very enthusiastic about the things of God, uh, very excited about, you know, being recently saved and mm. being in the ministry. He took the job and I think he thought that the job description was to preach the gospel to every employee <laughs> uh, at this company. Yeah. He came in, he would always bring tapes, he would play the tapes during the work hours, and then he would evangelize, you know, from early in the morning until uh, the day concluded. Mm. And, of course, when when this happened, honestly, I was condemning myself because it's like, well, I don't talk to everybody. I mean, when there were opportunities during the lunch hour, break time, I would take those opportunities when they presented themselves, but... I felt like I was, he was Billy Graham and, and I was uh, just gotten saved off the streets. Yeah. And, but what eventually happened was uh, he was fired. 
And he, when I asked him, he came back and he says, I've been fired. I lost the job. And I said, well, why? What, what was the reason? He said, well, he goes, there's no reason. It's just persecution. Uh-huh. So that was an imbalance in yes. that young man's life. Yeah. Because I think he was under the assumption that they hired him to preach the gospel to everybody that worked in the company, when in reality, they hired him with a completely different job description. That's correct, yeah. And, you know, to create that balance, let's say you're in the workplace and you're working with people that don't know Christ, do you have a responsibility? Uh, Do you owe them the gospel? According to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm a debtor to all men. Yeah. Yeah, but on... Not on the company's time, but on your free time. When you have a break, a coffee break, or when you're going out to lunch with them, uh, that's when you take the opportunity to share the gospel. And for this young man to say, yes, it was persecution, I was fired but for the gospel's sake, it simply wasn't the case. It was a real imbalance in his approach to the work. Yeah, actually, when we're hired to do a job, we, we have a task that we're hired for, and we owe that. We're getting paid to do that. And, you know, we have a, a benefit as a Christian of being able to objectively do our jobs and we can still be subjectively meditating on the word. We can be praying, we can be thinking, you know, as our job allows, um, our focus, if we have the opportunity, we could be doing something physical, but it doesn't require us to memor- you know, not be meditating on the word. Those are all awesome things. But I really do think, and we've always heard in our ministry that we are to give eight for eight, right? Yes. We, we're hired to work for eight hours. We give eight hours of work. Um, it doesn't mean we lose our identity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, the difference between our occupation and our vocation. You know, we, we could be very much settled on what our call is in our life, and then we have a tent-making skill that makes it possible, like the Apostle Paul himself, right? And we... I, we always said in, in Hungary, when I was on the mission field there, we worked at the school, and it was a little different because it was a Christian school, and it did have a mission in and of itself. Mm-hmm. But it really was just to support my missionary habits. You know, like the, the mission life, the, the call of God to be in Hungary and minister the gospel to Hungarians involved having to work. But while we were at work, you know, it's a grace ministry, but it's a works program. And uh, we are getting paid, and there is an expectation, and there's a, a set of guidelines that we're to follow. And if we're not doing that, then we're being dishonest because we're we're collecting money for something that we are promised, but we're doing something very different. So there is a time in our ministry, and we take our opportunities as God allows and leads. There's a time to to do the work that's necessary to be able to support the work that's broader than just our job. Yeah. And that finding that balance, um, I mean, there's there's no there's no book um, that you could purchase that would help you to find that balance between your work and your home, family, uh, ministry. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no, you just have to kind of figure that out. And again, you don't want to do one at the expense of the other. Mm-hmm. And it is possible, I think, for somebody, let's say, to be involved in the work of the ministry and to be neglecting their marriage or their family certainly or their home and and it it can happen and when something like that does happen that's when you have to sit down and you've got to say look i'm, I'm i've got some things out of balance in my life that's right and i've got to bring some stability back in each area yeah. of my life yeah and i think the priorities that we make for ourselves um one one uh article i read this week in preparation for this this topic was that um, was somebody said, uh, you know, when you have a call on your life, do you do you preach the gospel to yourself? Mm-hmm. Like, do you mm-hmm. do you say to yourself, this is the call I have for you? You know, yes. this is the way I want you to to walk, walk ye in it. And uh, it's very easy for us to maybe kind of lose focus of what that call is. And uh, our family lives are an extension of our call. And I it's. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think it's interesting that we can have ministry with our family, in our family. Our family can be connected with our ministry. And I know in my particular case, it's really hard for my wife if I have a call in my life and it demands a lot of my life, but I don't spend the time to include her in that call. That could be very troubling for her because she is one with me and, and feels the 
you know, the stress of my job or feels the tiredness or the, um, the challenges or the problematic things. But if she doesn't feel like she's my partner in it, and, and that could mean just in prayer life. It could mean just in having a cup of coffee and talking f- through a few things. And actually, I found my wife to be a great sounding board for something that we're wise about this. There's certain mm-hmm. things that are don't need to be brought home. Um, I try to, in some to some degree, compartmentalize my work life and my home life. Um, but there are other things that she helps me think through and, and has a good word in season or you know, remembers a different time in my life where we did something similar and, and has something to offer. So I think the priorities that we set for ourselves, the focus that we set for ourselves, we're either going to get a lot of help at home because they're one with us in our vision and our mission and say, hey, this is our vision and our mission, or there's going to be a lot of resentment because there's neglect on my family life and, uh, you know, a lot of emphasis on my work life. Now, there, there are some practical things which we'll get into we can talk about but one really awesome thing is in our schedules when we set up our schedules we can set up our schedules with spots in them that are blank on purpose and i think that you know sometimes we confuse the call of god for being a non-stop blur without rest without sabbath you know and i think that the um you know the sabbath was created for man not man for the sabbath we don't have to be in, in bondage to you know, the Sabbath principle, but on the other hand, that principle of rest in our lives is what gives us the ability to be able to minister in a healthy way. And sometimes that rest is being at home, quiet with our family. Sometimes it's sometimes we go with our family and we're just refreshed in our, our lives and our thinking. Sometimes we combine the two, you know, we have a ministry event, but it's with my family and I'm not only ministering to the person I'm ministering to, but my family is ministering with me and it gives a vision for the family we're ministering to that we too can have a walk with God and be encouraged and still have joy in our lives. And I think one of the mistakes that we make is that we, we don't make our, our home life sacred while we have a call on our, our jobs. And that's an imbalance. Like the call on our home life is just as valuable as the call in our job life. They're both essential in, in what we do. Um, and I was always careful in the ministry aspect not to be familiar with the, the privacy of my home for my wife and for my daughter. And, you know, like we had definitely had times where we were hospitable and had people over and it was very much with my wife's encouragement and blessing. And actually it helped her. It gave her some vision in her ministry as well. But there were other times when she just needed to be with me. She yep. just needed to hear my voice or share her concerns or just know that we're thinking together on the same uh, wavelength, and there were times we really had to dedicate just for that. And this is our, the you know, the sa- the sacredness of our home was going to be just f- for that. Uh, so we, in all these things, we really have to be led by God, led by the Spirit, but also not have a a false balance in our hearts. Like, no, my ministry takes priority over my family. Well, you're not going to have a fi- a ministry very long if your family bails on you. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. And I like that thought uh, about rest because that's, that's an important and a crucial factor in our discussion, really in our theme all week long. Because one of the many promises that Jesus gave was, I, look, I will give you rest. Yes. In Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Um, and that's something that we need. Now, that's not to say that, you know, it's going to be this perpetual rest and you're going to just kick back and, and you're not going to be fruitful or productive in your life. That's not what he meant. Yeah. Because... On the other side of the coin, we see some people, maybe the question they have to ask themselves is, what is it that I should stop doing? Yes. Because that balance, you hear believers sometimes say, well, you know, I can't do anything, you know. Well, that's not true. And then you have other believers that say, well, you know, I really think I have to do everything. Yeah. Well, that's not true either. Right. Right. Um, everybody has something to do and they need to discover what it is that they bring to the table in terms of the work of the ministry, and then they should do it. Yes. Again, it's not going to be nothing and it's not going to be everything. That's right. But it's going to be something because it's that which every joint supplies that creates the fullness of who Christ is in in his body and his kingdom on the earth. Yeah, absolutely. And actually... 
I remember Pastor Stevens in his ministry giving definition for success, and that was finding out what the will of God for your life is and doing it. And that doesn't mean that every person is called to the same kind of ministry. And actually, when you consider the life of a pastor, they're called to study to the point of exhaustion, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, They counsel people in the midst of their trauma. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're praying so that they have the wherewithal to hear the voice of God in their ministry. Um, They are visiting people who are in challenged situations. In some sense, you'd say, why would anybody want to do that? Well, because of the call. Yeah. You know, and the call is what, when we're called to something, we find our rest not necessarily just in a vacation. Um, Sometimes it's in a, a quiet moment. You know, I, I really enjoy the early morning, the older I get, the, the earlier I get up, whether I like it or not. <laughs> but I actually enjoy that first hour of the morning. I remember Pastor Schauer was preaching about this recently. I don't remember where, but um, about the first hour of the day and how the first hour of the day is that time when we are quiet and we can meditate with God and we can think and we can order our thoughts and so many times it's what gives us the impetus to be able to go through our day with some value. And I think the, the balance that we're talking about is having a, a, a sustainable rhythm in our lives. And the cool thing about that is that just like any other part of our life, there are seasons. Um, we may know that there's going to be a season coming up in our ministry, you know, for you guys in the camp season or when there's just something that's going to take a lot of focus a lot of energy, a lot of production, but then there's a, a glorious, you know, event and there's fruit from it. And then there's the aftermath. And then you might need to purposely take a little season where you have some planned downtime mm-hmm. and there's nothing unproductive about that. As a matter of fact, if you didn't have that planned downtime or some gaps in your schedule where you could just be a little bit flexible, you're not going to have the energy or the vitality to be able to do what it is God wants in the midst of your schedule. That's right. So this is this is something that every believer, you know, we could get zealous in our thoughts and say, I, there's, there's only seven days in the week and the Lord's work is never done. And it's true. But if you're burned out or you're physically exhausted and you, you don't have any value, <laughs> you're not helping the kingdom of God. Yeah. So I think I, I really do like this principle. And I, I, we had the staff meeting this week, and Pastor Shower was just talking about the value of the body and how different people, you know, in their ministry, we're not all just there as participants receiving the word, but we're actually there as a minister of the gospel to the person sitting next to us, just greeting somebody, just getting to know somebody, having an investment in their lives. Like this is an extension of the vision of the leader. And if you don't have healthy workers, help, healthy uh, team life happening, then the pastor's not going to be able to maintain what he has. And also, I love to hear, you know, Pastor Shower say, oh, yeah, we had a little family lunch, and we were all laughing and cutting up with each other, and, you know, they're joking with each other. And Pastor Justin even said it the other day, we like to roast each other, and it's our fun family. But they love each other. But there's something very healthy and encouraging about that, that they, they step aside. They have a little time private with their families, and it encourages them, and then they're given in their ministries. Mm. And it's a beautiful thing for us to be able to have that kind of energy. Mm. And it's not just, you know, the 21st century church trying to figure out this balance um, and, and in, in the Christian life between the ministry and full-time job, their families, their children. I mean, this happened in the book of Acts, you know, because the church began to grow. The church was flourishing. God was blessing. And, you know, people were being neglected and they weren't being served and taken care yeah. of. And, of course, the apostles themselves, I, you can just imagine, they were immersing themselves in that work until mm-hmm. finally they made the conclusion that you just arrived at a moment ago. You know, we're going to just fizzle out. We're going to burn out. Right. We're going to collapse here. Uh, if we don't delegate some of this authority that we have and responsibility that we have. And I love what their conclusion was, that the apostles would give themselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. Mm. And those other responsibilities would be handed to, again, qualified individuals within the body of Christ to get the job done. Yeah, yeah. And there's one article writer said, caring is sharing. And I know that sounds trite, but... 
if you really care about the work of God and the ministry of God, why would we rob people of sharing in that vision? And, you know, we, we can see many instances in the Bible where men of God delegated uh, or had people in their ministry that would step up and take part of that ministry, and it made the whole thing possible. And, you know, we all need in our lives, even if it's just somebody who's encouraging us, right? God calls us to go, but to have somebody that say, hey, I'd like to go with you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what what would you like to do? I'd just be with you, just encourage you, you just pray or, or you know, and then you, you find, wow, this person has a heart after God in the same area that I do. And it's an energy um, that's involved in that. It, there's a real blessing in, in that going together. And also... <laughs> Just to be able to laugh, just to be able to, and this is why I value my my family life so much. Mm-hmm. I don't laugh with anybody like I laugh with my wife. It was in our vows, you know, that whatever, whatever we do and wherever we go, we're always going to laugh. And I think that's been a huge pressure relief because when we're in trouble in situations, we vow that we were going to laugh. And mm-hmm. um, I need that. I need that that part of my life. And, and you know, Jeff Brunty Pastor Jeff, how are you, sir? Good to see you on the, the chat. But he says every step is a divine appointment. I agree. There's divine appointments to go. There's divine appointments to stop. There's divine appointments to wait. There's divine appointments to engage. Like sometimes it's what we say. Sometimes it's what we don't say. And if we don't have that opportunity to have a rest, a place of rest, a, a, a Sabbath, so to speak, in our lives, then it's going to end up being striving and it's going to end up being burnout, as you just said. So we need to have that place where we can just sit back and relax and hear the voice of God. And then when God says, go, we go and we trust him for the provision along the way. And it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's really actively going. And sometimes we're reflecting on what happened and we're thinking and meditating and praying about what we could do next. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it's waiting on God. God has a season in our lives for us to wait. That's right. Yeah, sometimes God does say go, and sometimes God does say no. Yeah. And I know in my, my character, my makeup, I, ha- I have to learn how to say no. Yeah. Because, I, you know, I want to do, do everything. Yes. I don't want to say if somebody comes and says, hey, can you do this? Could you preach here? Could you come for this conference? Could you, you know, do this meeting? I, don't want, I never want to say no. Yeah. But you have to learn how to say no because— I think that Moses, I mean, this is the Old Testament equivalent of what we just mentioned in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Everybody, you talk about two and a half million, you know, grownups, yes. adults, let alone children, all <laughs> coming to Moses for, with their problems, with their counseling needs, with, oh with, with what they had to deal with. And it was his father-in-law that said, you know what? If this continues, we will kill Moses. <laughs> he will die. Yeah. So they distributed uh, the responsibilities that Moses was once undertaking by himself mm-hmm. to 70 elders within the nation of Israel. And and Moses could continue to be used by God. Yeah. And if that didn't happen, I honestly do believe that his father-in-law was right, that he would have just collapsed. There was a, an, I think it was a Scottish preacher centuries ago who died at a very young age in his 30s. And he said, Something to the effect that, alas, he says, God has given me a message and a horse to carry that message with. Yes. He said, I have killed the horse, and I cannot deliver the message. Wow. And he died yeah. in his early 30s. Yeah. So that can happen. And we want to share some thoughts in today's broadcast that will help everybody that's listening say, yeah, I've got to, I've got to strike that balance in my life so that that doesn't happen. Yeah, yay and amen. And I appreciate I have a, a staff that works in the school with me. And even though I have oversight of the details of the school, I have a lot of things that happen there that I don't have to have my hands on. And I'm very happy to have it that way. You know, we, um, <clears throat> some of the, you know, the, the girls, they laugh, they go, the, this is on a need to know basis and you don't need to know. You put me in this place and I'm going to take care of it and don't worry about it. And if it's a trouble situation, we'll let you know. And I, I am so comfortable with that mm-hmm. because they share in the vision. I know that what they're doing is within the confines of how God's called us to do it. And they're just saying, look, there's, there's just some details that you don't need to know. You don't need to, do you really want to know what's, 
you know, how many of those clipboards went to this classroom and that. It's like, no, actually, I don't. I'm very happy. I'm very happy not to have to have control over all those things. Actually, I think there's a liberty in that, right, in our lives. And we maybe, when we're younger, the control is the power. Mm -hmm. You know, to me now, (laughs) the lack of having to control is the power. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, this, this organization, this organism operates together in the vision that God's created in a way that I don't have to enter into like oversight of every detail. And I I remember just, you know, and it's kind of God's sense of humor that, you know, of course, when, when you make yourself available to God, he's, he's apt to use us. Right. Absolutely. But at the same time, we're learning and growing along the way and we, we mess up and he encourages us and we get up and we go forward. Right. And sometimes I, we had a, an event a couple summers ago where I said to my wife, hey, you want to go to Maine? They're having this church reunion up in Maine. It would be a, just a blast. We can go there and do absolutely nothing except sit in the pews and maybe go get a lobster. <laughs> and, and she kind of laughed at me, and I was like, what? You, you don't think that's possible? And she said, no. I said, She said, yeah, I want to go. Let's do it. Let's go and rent the hotel and just enjoy the coastline. But – but I said, you think I'm going to get involved somehow? And she goes, yep. <laughs> and sure enough, I showed up there and Pastor Hadley had an emergency, had to come home. And uh, Pastor, Pastor Colby was like, you know, hey, I need you. <laughs> so, and it was beautiful. It was a great time. We ended up doing part of the baptism and Worthy Pond. I got to see the, the original location and uh, shared a couple messages as part of the, the reunion. But it it, you know, it was because we were there and we were available and it was a flow of of God's life. But to not have to strive and not to think about how is this going to happen, who's organized, what's the – there's so much liberty in that, you know. And and just to be able to hear the voice of God and have a divine appointment and, and uh, yeah, we could destroy the horse and not have the ability to deliver the message by our own thinking. and. Sure. And uh, we can control parts of our schedule. You know, we can in, it, not in the sense that we say, you know, I have to have control over everything that happens, but I'm going to plan certain little Sabbath rests in my schedule. And as the flow of my calendar gets busier and busier, sometimes we have to say, this is blocked off. And I do have little points on my calendar where it says no schedule zone. And they don't schedule things in those spots. It doesn't mean that I'm not doing anything there. It just means that there's an overflow or there's a situation that comes up or sometimes just a pause, like a selah in our lives, just to say, okay, this has been awesome. What do I need, Lord, to be prepared for the next aspect of my life? Yeah. Those times are crucial. Now, what about this? the idea, and we hear this a lot, uh, people – in terms of prioritizing their lives as believers. Um, sometimes you hear people say it's God first and family second and church third. Um, then you have a very popular radio broadcast for years entitled Focus on the Family. Um, well, do we focus on the family and then what happens with God? Do we? How do we keep him in focus? I mean, how do you approach that That process that people try to, that scale of priorities that people always try to create, because sometimes it's different one from the other. Yeah. And uh, how do we go about creating the proper priorities in our lives? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the question at stake here. And if we could answer that perfectly, we probably wouldn't have the need for this kind of a discussion. (laughs) That's Um, right. But we do realize that what matters in my life really ultimately what matters in my life is that am I fulfilling the will of God for my life or not? Now, along the way, he equips us with things that we need in our call that are going to allow us to be the most efficient at our call. This is why, as pastors, when we counsel young men and young ladies who are entering into relationships, we really tell them, be prayerful and be considerate. And I know there's, you know, all of us, (laughs) there's a certain age where it's like you're just so desirous of seeing where's this going to happen and how's it going to happen and who's it going to be. And it's so exciting. And I'm, I'm glad that that's kind of the way it is. Otherwise we wouldn't go after those relationships, but also if we're not wise and we're not careful, 
we could end up being waylaid from our relationship with God. And I think God brings those familial relationships together to help supply what we need in our call for life. And part of my call for life is being a dad to my daughter, a husband to my wife, you know, being able to take care of the home while I can, having to take care of myself so that I can be available to do that, those things. And it is God first, but this is how God equipped me in my call. So I'm not going to let the horse get broken down so that the message can't be delivered. So I do think the priority is God's will. And part of God's will is that I would have a family that is healthy and wholesome and ready to be part of the vision together. And there's part of that vision where they're very active. They could be active. They could be partaking. And there's part of it where they're stepping back and they're just saying, we got this covered so that you can do that. And I do think that's also seasons in our life. You know, mm-hmm. when my daughter was young and being raised in Hungary, there were times when it was really hard for my wife because that was her entire ministry. But I would come home and say to her, no, you don't understand how in- invaluable your ministry to our family is for this season so that I can be in the Bible school or doing that Bible study. or But then imagine if I don't take that and come home and say, hey, here's what's happening. She could feel like an outsider, like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm here mm-hmm. taking care of the family while you're off having the, the fun. But actually, I think what she did was just as sacred, just as amazing. No, no doubt. And we hear that in throne words, you know, do, doing dishes in the dish room is just as sacred as winning yes. souls in London. or you know, And it's true. It's true. So there is... There is a very practical balance, and I think being having an ear to, to hear God in those areas, and there's times when I need to put a little pause on a ministry event and say, I got to take, I have to pay attention in my family life. And there's times in my family life where I could say, guys, I, I, I need to go do this, but it's all, it's all complimentary. Um, instead of being in competition, it's complimentary to one another. Yeah. Amen. Um, I often think of Dr. Billy Graham and how much time he spent away from his family um, for for ministry purposes, yeah. I mean, to preach the gospel. Perhaps no one in modern history has preached the gospel to more people than Billy Graham had while he was with us. And that had to be challenging for his oh, family. Yeah, sure. um, I mean, I've heard interviews and seen them and watched them, you know, where he and his wife are sitting together and the interviewer would ask his wife, you know, uh, well, you know, your husband is away so much. Uh, isn't that difficult? And she honestly evaluated it and said, yes, it has been difficult. But I know that this is the call of God upon his life. Yeah. And when he is here and when we are together, you know, we redeem that time. Yes. We make the most of that time. Those times are valuable and precious. I, I just don't sense seeing his family now, and his children and his grandchildren. I don't get the idea that they despise him or regretted the fact that he fulfilled the will of God and the call of God. But I don't get, I don't get that. So he obviously kept his ministry life and his family life, his home life in a, in a balanced way because they are not angry at him. No, they don't look back and say he should have been here more. I, did they wish he was perhaps, Yeah. but there's a difference. I mean, and, and pastor Shaler mentioned it yesterday. I think if there was a need for him to be there, he would have been there. Absolutely. And I think they learned to admire the fact that he was willing to hear the voice of God for both ministry and family. And there is some sacrifice. We're not going to say that there's no sacrifice. You know, it's not a being in the ministry is not a nine to five job. It's some days it's very demanding. It's all ends of the day. It's hours upon hours. It's burdens in your heart. And um, just a a funny anecdotal story about Billy Graham and his wife. When they asked her about that relationship and they said, you know, the the quote, uh, you know, have you ever thought about divorce? He's gone so many. Have you ever thought about divorce? She said, divorce? Never. Murder? Often. (laughs) But they even had a a sense of humor about it that like, look, it produces real life challenges. And, you know, if I come, if I'm gone in the, in the work of the Lord all day long and, and in our lives, in the ministry, in school life and with young people and there's teachers and there's families and there's parents and there's all these things that any one of those things could be the point of attack for that particular day. 
And if I don't have the provision from God, it's, it's a downhill battle. Now, if I come home carrying that trouble and that burden, I'm not going to have a good relationship at home. I'm not going to have time or effort. And there, it, it is a, a conscious decision sometimes to say, this is just as important in my ministry as other things. But also, there's a whole lot of grace. My wife gives me a whole lot of grace. There's times when she just says, how was school today? And I look at her and she goes, you know what? <laughs> Let's talk about something else. And, and it's not that I don't want to share. It's just that I have to like process and take a deep breath and, and have that say la moment. And she gives me that opportunity, you know, which is really, it's a precious thing. It's, it's not something that I ever planned for. When I was looking for a wife, I need somebody that when I'm in my ministry and have stressful days, she's going to know when to ask and when not to ask. But it's one of the benefits that God gave us, which is really amazing. Yeah. So it goes without saying that when you're involved in the work of the ministry, there will be a price that you have to be willing to pay. And, of course, in in a marriage relationship, in a family relationship, uh, everybody needs to understand that. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, I like what you said about including your spouse or including your family as much as possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, my children growing up and my being the youth pastor in the ministry, um, that that was like a, a two-edged sword. You know, on the one hand, they were participating and active and involved. On the other hand, it's like I can't get away from my father. Yes, exactly. Not only is he home all the time with yeah. us, but now whenever we want to do anything on, of a social nature with, with the church, he's got to be there too. Yeah. So, I mean, there were times when I actually would apologize to my children and say, look, yeah. I'm so sorry that I have to constantly be around a guy that's yeah. always present. Yeah. Uh, but but they, you know, they got through it and they realized that, yeah, there's – there were sacrifices that they would have to make as well. For sure. I mean, we, I was my daughter's principal in high school, and I knew that that was a challenge for her. And we were overseas, and it was different. And, um, but I, would, you know, I took the course where I would walk into the cafeteria and say, oh, my daughter, my precious daughter, and give her a kiss on the cheek. And she'd be like, Dad, get out of here. And I did it. <laughs> in one sense, it drove her crazy. In the other sense, it was a great privilege, you know, yeah. she had, and I always purposed, like, I'm not going to treat her any more special than any of the other students, but also I'm not going to treat her any less than any of the other students because the temptation could be, oh, that's just my family. They don't get the same benefit that, no, they're, they're just as much as part of that vision and the, the people, um, any other area. And I picked and chose. There were things where maybe other parents would get involved going on a trip or a field trip or when I just said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give her a little liberty to be able to do her thing. Um, I know for the most part, I think the fact that we gave liberty, she really wouldn't care about you know certain things. I'm <laughs> thinking of a, a play we did for one of the, the high school banquets that she was in and it just had a little – Costume mishap, and, uh, you know, she's just looking at me like, oh, my gosh, this is my dad, you know, running around the room. And I was dressed like the Incredible Hulk and <laughs> green <laughs> paint all over me. And anyway, it's just a funny situation, but we still laugh about it, you know. It's And, and to this day, it's like, oh, my gosh, my friends are all there watching you run around, and I had a rip in my pants. And it was just, <laughs> it was just one of those situations. But um, – you know, graciousness, we get the graciousness back when we invest in. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is a, it's an amazing thing. And it, it shouldn't be our expectation that you're just, you should give me room. Mm-hmm. You know, no, we, we can cultivate that, right? And when we do and we spend the right time and quality time, it's not going to probably be quantity of time. And when you have a youth ministry or you have, you know, something in the, in the, the line of a leadership and a ministry, mm-hmm. it's, it's probably less quantity because it takes a lot, as you said. I mean, Billy Graham had a ministry that was so much bigger. And, and in Hungary, I was part of the watching the organization of the Franklin Graham ministry because he, they came to the local church early. And they had really delegates that would go before them and work with the locals and figure out the, the translation and who's going to come and minister and counsel after the salvation call and what churches would we refer them to? And it's a huge work. Yeah, um, It's not just Franklin Graham who has an amazing work on his own, but there is a huge work. 
But when we invest time with our families and we give them the, the, the quality that they need to feel a part of the ministry, and then they have a vision themselves to give you what you need for that ministry, um, you get a lot more back yeah. than just expecting it, which is, is unfair to them. And it's, it's really not a right stewardship of what God gave you as a resource for your ministry. Yeah. And I remember all of those conversations while we were in Bible college years ago, because often as students, we would come together and the question would be asked, you know, ah, how, do you, how, how are you doing and how are you handling this with full-time Bible college, full-time work, and not neglecting your marriage or your children? <laughs> um, we talked about that a lot. And basically, you know, there was no formula that someone presented to any of us that said, here it is, this right. is how you do it. We basically all said, you know, just keep walking with God and figure it out. It's a faith Find walk. the balance. Yeah. That's yeah. all. Yes. It's not, uh, it's not rocket science. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It really is a work of faith. We, yeah. If God called me and God is equipping me, I have to trust God for his provision. But I also have to be sensitive to the resources he gave me, um, being faithful to the call. You know, it's not a mismanagement of any it, – it's a, so much above us anyways, right? There's so, the work of God is so far above us. It's a privilege for us to be a part of that work of God. But I remind God quite often, I cannot do this if you're not in this. So yeah. I need you in this, right? If your grace doesn't go with me, Lord, right? And, and um, there's no harm. There's Actually, that's a great blessing to be able to say, you know, the work of God is of God. It's not of me. Mm. Uh, and I need to be able to be st- – and. Hey, that means finances, that means our home, that means our, our vehicles, that means all the things that we have no control over how they're going to perform. We have to give to submission to God and understand that I can be wise as I can possibly be, but ultimately God's going to have what he has happen, happen. And it'll turn into a blessing if I allow him to let it be a blessing in my life. And I will be burned out if I decide to try to figure it out myself because yeah. it's not possible. You know, Paul um, wrote about the ministry, and we'll we'll wrap it up with what he said to the Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter three, verse five. He put it all in perspective. He said, "Not that we are sufficient mm. of ourselves mm-hmm. to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God." Yeah, Amen. That just puts it in perspective. Yeah. We, we, we do we have what it takes? No, but is God willing to give us what we need? He is. He is. And if we just trust him, as you said, look to him and wait upon him, uh, we'll, we'll strike that balance and we'll find peace in our homes and peace in our families and peace in the call of God in the work of the ministry. Yeah, and it's a complete work of God. It's not an imbalanced work of God where he only is with us while we're preaching in the pulpit or while we're ministering in, in counseling or while we're... Um, visiting somebody who's afflicted or ill or whatever that situation is, but it's it's the complete work of God where it, it is with us in our times of refreshing and it's with us in our times of family life and it's with us, you know, we're, we we are guys who love our sports events, right? Mm-hmm. And in this day and age with the 24-hour sports programs and soccer in this country at six hours ahead and, mm-hmm. We could, we could be nonstop given to that, right? But it would become sublimation. Sure. Instead of being something that we can enjoy and partake of in a healthy manner when time is appropriate, it could become a, an idol in our lives. And our sure. families could become an idol in our lives, right? We could cling so tightly to our family life that we lose the work of God. That's right. And, and that's why this, this balance, true balance with God, and it involves giving it to God. It involves listening to what God gives us, focusing on it, you know, not being a, a poor steward of the time that he gives us. God will, will be faithful to reveal himself, and there will be ebbs and flows, and we'll have successful times, and we'll have times of challenge. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, did we find out what God had for us, and were we willing to let him do it? Amen. Well, we hope that we've been able to shed some light on this all-important all theme about learning that balance between work and home life and ministry work. And there may be some that might still say, well, I, I haven't figured it out. And we would say, you will. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Trust God. Amen. 
Thank you so much for joining us for today's Grace Hour broadcast, friends, and we hope that you enjoy the uh, the taped broadcast coming up on Thanksgiving Day. That's tomorrow, so tune into the Grace Hour then, and we wish you all a, a blessed, blessed Thanksgiving celebration with your loved ones, friends, and family. Until tomorrow at the same time, may God bless you. <laughs>